When it comes to saving lives, rescuers go wherever they're needed, but sometimes that turns out to be dangerous. In Nashville, Tennessee, paramedic Maurice Tidwell and his partner James Pollard thought they were prepared for any emergency until April 13th, 1988. About 2 a.m., we received a call to go to Tennessee State Prison. We didn't think anything of it because we went out there quite a bit. We get on the prison grounds like we normally do, go through a guard shack that's out near the highway, and he mostly is forced to go on through, which is normal. We proceeded to checkpoint one. That's the point where we go and pick up a guard to go inside the walls of the compound because we have to be escorted inside there. Normally, we have to wait to get a guard there for anywhere from 5, 10, 15 minutes, depending on what the problem is. That particular night, there was one standing in the parking lot waiting on us. We proceeded around to the vehicle gate, which is around the side of the compound. The guard got out of the ambulance, put his weapon in a bucket, and it was raised into the tower. They don't take their weapons inside the walls with them. At that point, the ambulance goes into what they call a vehicle trap. There's two gates. They open one, you pull in, they shut it, and then you're in between the two locked gates where they do a search of the ambulance. That particular night, we came up to the vehicle gate. Both gates were open. We were flagged on through. The ambulance was not stopped in the trap. It wasn't searched. Everyone was in such a hurry, it gave you the impression that one of the guards was hurt or sick real bad. We entered in through the front door of that infirmary, which is electronically controlled. There's, there's never a guard at that point except the one that comes in with us. Once we got to the treatment room, we walked in and there's one man, Mr. Corley, is in the wheelchair. Beside him is the nurse that's in the infirmary. I gave the first ambulance attendant vital signs that was unreal. He looked at me because he realized, hey, this man shouldn't be living with this kind of bogus information. So your chest is hurting you? Yeah. We're, we're... Listen up. Yeah. We go into the ambulance. We're going to act like nothing's wrong. Right. And if you blow it, everybody's going to die. Right. I'll kill everybody in here. All right, take it easy. Get that stretch over here now. All right. take it easy. The uncertainty of take what the next action was going to be led everyone to be on edge. Get down now. Touch me, man. Touch me. During a previous escape attempt, Corley had been shot and paralyzed when he killed a hostage. When the gun stuck to your head, you know that there's a crazy man that's holding it. You don't know if you're going to live the next minute. You don't know if you're going to see daylight. Everybody, keep it cool. Let's walk in the park. All right. Take it easy. You take it easy. The second inmate, Mr. Driver, said that he was going as well. Uh, and if any questions were asked of why he was going out, that we were to tell him that he was going to help load the patient. Both prisoners were convicted murderers, serving life sentences in the maximum security prison. We passed one guard on the way, which did not question why we had two inmates and the nurse going out with us, which is not standard procedures. We only transport one person at a time, and prison personnel, the only one that goes with us is a guard. We never take the medical personnel with us. Corley was someone that you feared. Corley was a murderer the third time. He didn't have anything to lose, and he told me he didn't have anything to lose. And I knew he didn't have anything to lose. I knew that we were in trouble, and there was a real danger for our lives there. 
but I didn't anticipate ever getting past the checkpoint. Get in, get in, everybody, in! My partner was directed to get up front and drive. Myself, the nurse, and the guard were directed to get into the back of the ambulance. And the second inmate got in and sat down in the floor of the ambulance and covered himself up with the fire coat that I had in the back. We're headed back to the vehicle entrapment area. Normally, we are locked down again between two gates. That night, none of that took place. They did not search the vehicle. They didn't ask for their transfer papers. They did no ID verification with the supposed patient. Nor did they even look in. Had they even looked in, they would have seen that there was someone else sitting in the floor covered up under a coat. My partner started to drive off. Mr. Corley hollered at him to stop and do everything just like you always do. The guard got out of the back, went over to the tower area where the guard in the tower lowered his weapon in the bucket. When he got in, he handed it to Corley, and Corley turned around and gave it to Driver, which gave both of them the weapon. Come on, go! Once we'd gotten outside the trap, they had two weapons, then the fear started setting in. I felt that they would do anything that they had to do to keep from going back. Think about slowing down, you understand? There was a guard out next to the shack at the highway run him, run him. that stepped out into the street in an attempt right to stop through. the ambulance. Come on. Captain, I couldn't stop him, ma'am. When we continue. Come on, hit him! Hit him! He had me positioned between him and the window so that if any bullet should come through that window, it would hit me and not him. It had been only a few minutes since two convicted murderers hijacked an ambulance and escaped from prison with a paramedic, an EMT, a nurse, and a guard held hostage. The police had no idea where they were heading. Attention on cars, we've got a report ambulance number 19 has been hijacked from the main prison. Two prison escapees have taken four hostages. These subjects are armed and dangerous. I was sitting on the side of the interstate. It was a possibility that the ambulance that was taken would come that way. Patrolman Michael Franks had heard about the escape on his police radio. Just a few minutes after I was there, the ambulance did come by me, and I fell in behind them. We got somebody coming up behind us. What is it, man? I have the ambulance inside. We got cops are coming around on your side. I just watched for a few minutes, then pulled up side to see if it could be the ambulance. Well, be cool, man. Just be cool. When I pulled up to the driver's door at that point, I noticed that the passenger did have a pistol. I pointed at the driver. It's on your side. Look. I see him. I see him. At this point, I just pulled back behind the ambulance and followed it, waiting for other cars so they could assist in the stop. I doubted very seriously that I would ever go back home again. I felt that one of us would be killed. Uh, who it would be to start with, I don't know. We got a couple of miles out the interstate, and several other cars joined us. You know that you have to stop the ambulance. You're not going to solve anything by letting it leave the county. Come on, hit him! Hit him! Back there. Again, take him! Hit him! As I went in front of him, the car that was right behind me pulled up beside him on the driver's side and we had two patrol cars in the rear. We boxed them in at that point. Things became so chaotic in the back that I felt they were gonna kill us. The inmates were waving their weapons around, threatening to shoot people. We started easing them over to the right side of the road. We just brought them to a slow stop by just slowing our cars down gradually. We contained them in the ambulance. The two that uh, took the hostages have full control over everything. The 
What you doing? Watch yourself, Baba. Watch yourself. I'm what? Boom, put some tape on the window. Cover the window. Corley Pizza. said he wanted the windows Pizza. covered up. He did not want the police officer to see how we were positioned inside that ambulance. I was shaking, so I couldn't really tear the tape off. He had me positioned between him and the window, so that if any bullet should come through that window, it would hit me and not him. I left a little corner so that I could see out. Once we contained him in the vehicle, Lieutenant Kassman and several other officers started arriving. This is Lieutenant Kassman, police department. Who am I talking to? Paramedic Pitbull. Okay, well, what do they want? They want the PD to get out of the way and let us take them down the road a piece. Then they will let us out. But they will not at this point. They are holding us hostage at this point. Okay, I, I don't have the authority to do that. I've got the people that do have the authority in round. Captain Tom Dozier was the assistant team commander of the Nashville Police Department SWAT operations that night. I responded to the interstate where the ambulance had been stopped by the patrol division. As the team arrived, the team leaders were called into the SWAT van. Lieutenant Ken Pence was the entry team leader. This was an unusual situation because of the extreme um, violence potential, the likelihood that the people were going to get killed inside, that, that they were going to start killing hostages. Uh, they were not your ordinary citizen. They had made the decision to escape in penitentiary and they were on their way until the police department stopped them. Once we found out the entire situation, then we deployed our SWAT team in units. One unit is a gas team, one is a sniper team and one is an entry team. Go with each sniper man. I want your entry team as close to the rear door as you can. We need that key. Use it. Go. Hey, we had a duplicate key, so we practiced opening the door on a duplicate ambulance. Do you know which way the key turns? Because a half a second turning a key uh, could mean someone's life. The reason we could not use gas or didn't even think about it was the, the tanks of oxygen inside. We uh, shoot gas, it sets something on fire, you blow up, you kill everybody in the ambulance. This was a tricky situation because the snipers had to worry about not having any of the hostages in line with the line of fire. The standoff had already been going on for half an hour when hostage negotiator Sergeant Nancy Fielder arrived on the scene. We work as a team because we consult each other. We call it a think tank. We use one primary negotiator. I played that part on this particular call, but it's a team effort. One, if we don't move the police car and get out of the way and let them go on their own, we've got it surrounded. Nobody's heard it this time. Negotiators are in charge of the situation. Okay, ask him to pick up the mic and talk to me for a minute, please. He said to back the cars up and move away from us. He's not going to get on the mic. Tell him we don't want to get anybody hurt, that, you know, we want to resolve this situation. And the, the best thing they can do is just to come out now and, you know, everything's going to be okay. Nobody's going to be hurt. He said that everybody in here is going to die. Okay, well, we're going to move. He said they'll kill everybody in here and then turn the gun on themselves at this point if they don't let us go on down the road and then they'll let us out. Everybody in here to pick up the mic and talk to me for a minute, please. Who am I talking to? My name's Nancy. What's yours? Hey. I know what y'all doing. Now, this is the last time my boss is coming over this gun call. Either y'all start moving them cars up and get them out of the way. I'm gonna start throwing people out. That's the last word right there. Now y'all can do what you want to do with it. There's a lot of pressure because if you say the wrong thing, it, it might make the situation more volatile. I was worried about hearing a gunshot several times when I when I keyed the mic to talk to him. There's two persons in here with guns holding on us. And he's fixing the count out, and both of them are going to start shooting at the same time. Now, please move those damn cars in front of us. I don't have no 
personal desire to die tonight. Please don't hurt anybody. Just talk to me for a minute. Hey, look here. You keep on trying to tell me what you want. I'm telling you what I want. Now, it's going to be active. Body number one is on his way out. Don't do anything yet. Give, give me a minute. We're trying to get somebody to go up to the car now to move it back. Please don't do anything right yet. Well, he didn't want anything except for the police to let him go. That was all he was asking is just let me go. And that was something that was non-negotiable. We could not let him leave the scene. Nancy, he just cocked the gun and it pointed at him. Corley, don't do anything yet. We're still trying to get this taken care of back here. Give us a little time. You know, you got all night. There's no big rush. The hell it ain't. It's me in here, not you. If the shot was fired in that ambulance, our engine team was going in. Hopefully, if they shot one, we could save another one. We don't want anybody hurt. They're making the situation worse by not letting everybody go. If they will let everybody go, we will move these cars, they can take the vehicle, and they can go. I told them I wanted Tidwell to be let go because he was the one I was communicating with and he was under the most pressure because the gun was at his head so it was very important to get him out because he was making the situation inside where the hostages were more hysterical because of his behavior. How do you respond to a statement like that? There's no way you can respond to that when a, when a hostage feels like they're fixing to be killed and it's going to be your fault. Corlo, will you get back on and talk to me a minute? You just sort of have to feel your way through it. In this particular circumstances, I think probably being a woman might have helped me a little bit with Corley. Um, I don't know if it's because he'd been in prison or what. We're going to do what we can. We're going to do everything we can to resolve this situation without anybody getting hurt. Tell him to go ahead and let you out. Listen, Nancy, I'm going to come out. I'm coming out the passenger side of the door. And I'm going straight to that patrol car in front of it. If I'm going to kill my partner. Now we're going to take care of the car up there. I want you to come out and come back here to us. We're going to take care of the car up there. We're, we we got a police officer who's going to move the car. No, that's not the deal. The deal is I'm coming out and going straight to that car or they're going to kill my partner. I can't have that. You're not going to put that monkey on my back to have my partner killed. And that be on my conscience for the rest of my life. No way. I'm going to the car. After more than an hour of negotiation, paramedic Tidwell was let go. According to procedure, the SWAT team had to secure him until they could verify that he was not one of the escaped prisoners. Before I left, they told me, if we let you leave, and they don't move those police cars and let us go, we're going to kill your partner. That was real hard to swallow. I mean, I really felt deep down that I knew they were not going to move those police cars. But there was nothing I could do about it. What is your name, Bill? You going to lie to me? At that point, we didn't think that Corley would let the rest of the hostages go, so I was just trying to buy time for our SWAT team so that they could uh, devise a plan of how they were going to rescue the hostages. I to get everybody out safely. I told you that if you will let everybody out, we will move all the police cars and you'll be on your way. Do whatever you want to do. You're going to lie to me. If I let that man out, you're going to move. But only
Negotiations began to get very tense. We expected them to kill a hostage, throw them out. The snipers were given a green light. They could shoot when they had a clear shot. We expected that when the shot was fired, that when one of the hostage takers was killed, the other would turn his head toward the rear or toward the front. And at that time, we would knock out the windows and shoot the second one. I don't care. I know. I don't care whether I finally reached the point where I told him that if he killed hostages, that he knew that we, we would kill him. And that I didn't think that he wanted to die either. You don't want to kill yourself. You don't want to kill yourself. What I was doing is irritating him to some extent to keep him talking to me so that he wouldn't be uh, paying any attention to what was happening outside of the ambulance. Well, that's the best you got right now, sweetheart. I mean, you know, I don't think you want to die. I don't think either one of y'all want to die. And there's no need of hurting any of those innocent people in there. We will let you drive away if you let all of them out. Most hostages that are killed are killed um, statistically during a hostage rescue. If we had to shoot someone, we wanted to make sure that it was the hostage takers only. All of you come out, give up, and we can solve this situation right now. There's no need to be We fully expected and were waiting and calming ourselves for a sniper shot. And we saw the paramedic reach under his arm and unlock the door. Y'all so hell bent on getting killed. You don't want to get killed tonight. You don't want to kill yourself. When the paramedic jumped out the front, we were forced to initiate the tactical rescue. The side door was open and other SWAT officers jerked driver out. Hey, what we say? Sergeant Bishop pulled the nurse out. Then we went in and while Corley was struggling, we got him cuffed and the situation was over. Corley had held Nurse Bone hostage at gunpoint throughout the four-hour ordeal. Not a shot was fired, and all of the hostages were rescued unharmed. Corley and Driver were sent back to prison and given more than two life sentences for escape and aggravated kidnapping. It's a great relief when it worked out as well as it did. Vivian Bone, the nurse, grabbed me and hugged me and thanked me. It's real hard to tell you just the kind of fear that does go through a person. It's real hard to tell you the intensity in which you have to control yourself not to just scream. You have to draw on everything that you've got, everything that you know that's within you just to cope with the stress at that time. I was amazed that uh, no one got shot in, in the uh, capture process. And I was amazed that I didn't get shot trying to escape when Corley told Driver to, to go ahead and shoot me and throw me out, he was supposed to be counting to three and shooting. Uh, when he got to two, uh, I saw the SWAT team on the side of the unit. It felt like if I could get the door open and get kind of halfway out, then they would protect me. Negotiators in this incident really bought us a lot of time. We call them the mouth marines because they really uh, make it easier for the SWAT team. They get people to give up a lot of the time. I think overall that the, the police department did a very good job on this whole situation. Uh, our negotiating team worked real hard and, and worked real well together. I think our SWAT team did a tremendous job. It was their expertise that got these hostages out, so uh, most of the credit I have always said goes to them. I believe that we came so close to being killed that just to think about it sometimes is nerve-wracking. My most thankful part of it is that I'm alive, my partner's alive, the people that were innocent victims in it are still alive. Everybody's in custody, nobody's hurt.